Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for standing by, and welcome to the New York Mortgage Trust First Quarter 2020 Results Conference Call. During today's presentation, all parties will be in a listen-only mode. Following the presentation, the conference will be open for questions. If you have a question, please press the star followed by the one on your touchtone phone. If you would like to withdraw your question, please press the pound key. If you are using speaker equipment, we do ask that you please lift the handset before making your selection. This conference is being recorded on Friday, May 22, 2020. A press release and supplemental financial presentation with New York Mortgage Trust first quarter 2020 results was released yesterday. Both the press release and supplemental financial presentation are available on the company's website at www.nymtrust.com. Additionally, we are hosting a live webcast of today's call, which you can access in the events and presentation section of the company's website. At this time, management would like me to inform you that certain statements made during the conference call, which are not historical, may be deemed forward-looking statements within the meaning of the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. Although New York Mortgage Trust believes the expectations reflected in any forward-looking statements are based on reasonable assumptions, it can give no assurance that its expectations will be attained. Factors and risks that could cause actual results to differ materially from expectations are detailed in yesterday's press release and from time to time in the company's filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Now at this time, I would like to introduce Steve Muma, Chairman and CEO. Steve, please go ahead. Thank you, Operator. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for being on the call. Jason Serrano, our president, will also be speaking this morning as we talk through the first quarter presentation. I will be speaking to the company's overview and financial summary sections, while Jason will be speaking to our investment strategy and business outlook sections. The first quarter was defined by two periods, January 1st through March 9th, where the company continued to execute their plan, raising $500 million in accretive capital and deploying it into residential and multifamily credit investments and post-March 9th, where we saw unprecedented market disruptions from the COVID-19 global pandemic. As a response to these disruptions, we took decisive action to restructure our portfolio and focus on our core strengths, residential and multifamily credit opportunities. And at the same time, we focused on reducing our exposure to what we can't control, short-term mark-to-market borrowings or repos. Beginning on March 23rd and continuing through the quarter end, we sold over $2 billion in assets, reducing our outstanding repurchase agreements by $1.7 billion, finishing the quarter with $173 million in cash liquidity, $1.4 billion in unencumbered assets, and a portfolio leverage of 0.7 times. In early April, we completed a $250 million borrowing against our unencumbered residential loan portfolio. Combined with the proceeds we received from the settlement of securities sold in March, we were able to repay an additional $560 million in securities repo. After giving effect to these transactions, the company's liquidity improved to over $200 million while reducing our portfolio leverage further to 0.6 times. These actions did come at a significant cost, as the company had its worst quarter in its history seen its book value decline by 33% and temporarily suspending its quarterly dividends. However, we believe our efforts have better positioned the company to weather the oncoming economic storm caused by the pandemic and to recover some of the $300 billion of unrealized losses carried on our balance sheet, allowing us to return to delivering the, result, delivering the results to our stockholders that they have come to expect. I will now move over to slide six, our overview section. As of March 31st, 2020, our investment portfolio totaled $3 billion, and our total market capitalization was $800 million. As of last night's close, our total market capitalization had moved up to $1.1 billion. Today, our investment portfolio is 100% focused on credit strategies, choosing to, manage our, choosing to manage to our strengths of asset management in both residential and multifamily while reducing our dependency on mark-to-market leverage. We have 57 professionals employed across three offices, all working from home since March 13th. Moving over to slide eight, where I'll discuss market conditions and housing fundamentals. On the economic front, 
COVID-19 has impacted the global as well as our country's economy significantly. Our first quarter GDP contracted 4.8% and is expected to decline further in the second quarter. Unemployment rate was close to 15% last month, and we saw lifetime lows in the 10-year Treasury. Housing sales declined 17.8% last month, and home price appreciation is expected to decline 1% to 2% into the next year. In response to these factors, the U.S. government initiated several programs to help both businesses and consumers, committing upwards of $3 trillion to deal with this crisis. One of these initiatives, the CARES Act, which gives borrowers the opportunity to defer mortgage payments, directly impacts our business. We have a history of dealing with payment interruptions from our borrowers, and we, co we feel confident that as we emerge from this crisis, we will be able to assist and manage our borrowers back to their pre-crisis performance. In addition, given the dislocation in the mortgage credit markets, we believe this will present opportunities not seen over the, that we have not seen over the last several years. In slides 9, 10, and 11, I will address the COVID impact as it has had on our markets, our company, and our response. The U.S., and more specifically the mortgage market, started feeling the effects of COVID-19 in early March. On March 16th, we started experiencing increased margin calls, and by March 20th, it was clear we were, we were in a full-blown liquidity crunch. It was a combination of factors that impacted our company and our industry. Reduced liquidity access from the dealers for all types of collateral, decreased availability for credit-sensitive securities, and accelerating price declines due in part to increased margin calls and a lack of buyer participants, which were quickly transitioning from return on equity investors to return on asset investors. On March 23rd, we stopped meeting margin calls and began discussions on some form of forbearance relief from our securities lenders. Over the course of the next two weeks, we sold over $2 billion in assets, including 100% of our agency portfolio and 100% of our Freddie K. P.O. portfolio, reducing our securities repurchase borrowings by over $1.6 billion. By April 7th, we were able to pay an additional $560 million in repurchase agreements by utilizing the $213 million in proceeds from sales initiated in March and $250 million in increased borrowings from our residential loan portfolio. As of the day, the company has three lenders with a total outstanding of $1.1 billion in borrowings. We are in good standing with all, and ultimately, we never entered into any formal forbearance agreements. In addition, we have over $200 million in cash and $1.5 billion in unencumbered investments today. On slide 12, we'll, we'll, you, can see the, you can see the changes in the portfolio and leverage of the company from December 31, 2019 to March 31, 2020. Our company has a history of managing through volatile markets, but never have we experienced such rapid price declines without the corresponding underlying asset deterioration. Our decision to liquidate the agency and Freddie K portfolios was a difficult one, but necessary as we needed to reduce low-margin, high-leverage strategies and, and levered non-cash or liquid assets from our portfolio. We believe our remaining portfolio and credit investments gives us the best path to recover the book value, book value declines that we have incurred. We will maintain a disciplined and measured approach as we continue to monitor the effects of COVID-19 on our markets and focus on credit assets that rely less on leverage from short-term mark-to-market financing. In addition, we continue to focus on financing transactions that have longer committed terms and minimal or no exposure to mark to market. As we move over to the financial results, we've included, in, included in slides 26 to 34 is our quarterly comparative financial information section that will help in aiding discussions of our performance, our financial performance. On slide 14, we'll go through the first quarter financial snapshot which you can see our basic and diluted gap loss per share of $1.71 and comprehensive loss per share of $2.11. Our economic return for the quarter was a negative 32.6%. We, we temporarily suspended both our common and preferred dividends on March 23rd. We continue to evaluate market conditions and hope to reinstate our dividends in the near future. 
Our investment portfolio totaled three billion dollars, with 78 percent in credit asset in residential credit assets and 20 percent focused on multifamily credit assets. Our average net net margin, net interest margin for the first quarter was 2.92 percent up two basis points from the previous quarter. Our average asset yields decreased by 16 basis points, but that was more than offset by the 18 basis point decline in our cost of financing, primarily due to Fed actions which began late last year. With $2 billion in asset sales and the related reduction of $1.7 billion in borrowings, our quarter and portfolio leverage was 0.7 times and our overall leverage ratio was 0.8 times. As I previously stated, our current portfolio leverage is 0.6 times today. On slide 15, our first quarter summary, you can see that we had $512 million loss in the first quarter. I'm sorry, we had $512 million in equity raised in the first quarter with two successful raises, one in January and one in February, generating $20 million of accreted capital. In addition, we had $633 million in purchases through the first week of March. The last two weeks of March, we sold $2 billion in securities and loans, and we had a gap net loss of $599 million and a comprehensive loss of $241 million. Going into slide 16, where there's further details of our financial results, you can see that we had net interest income of $47.1 million, an increase of $3.1 million from the previous quarter. We would expect second quarter net interest income to decrease due to the sale, the portfolio sales that took place at the end of the March. However, we don't expect a significant decrease in our net interest margin in terms of basis point spread. We had nine interest losses totaling $622 million, including $153 million in realized losses and $397 million in unrealized losses. These losses were primarily related to the $2 billion in asset sales and the markdown of our quarter end portfolio valuation. Sales included $1.4 billion of agency and not agency securities, $550 million of Freddie K first loss POs, and $50 million in loan sales. Also included in the realized and unrealized losses was the impact of unwinding our entire swap portfolio. The company has over $300 million of unrealized losses still on its balance sheet balance sheet, which we believe we can substantially recover in the future as the world reopens post-COVID-19. We had total G&A expenses of $10.8 million for the quarter, an increase of $1.5 million from the previous quarter. This increase was largely attributed to $1 million related to long-term incentive costs, amortization costs, and a $500,000 increase in professional fees primarily related to the expenses incurred over the last two weeks of the quarter. For presentation purposes, the calculation of net loss attributable to common stockholders includes our preferred dividends. Even though they were not declared, the preferred dividends must be paid in full prior to any con common stock dividends and therefore included when determining net income for common stockholders. The graph on the page shows, that, shows the five quarters of book value. The first quarter of 2000, for the first quarter of 2000, for the first quarter of 2020, we broke out the realized and unrealized losses for the purpose of illustrating that almost two thirds of the book value decline is related to unrealized losses, which we believe we can substantially recover in the, in the future. I'll now turn the presentation over to Jason, who will go through our investment strategy. Jason. Thank you, Steve. Good morning. Uh, starting on, on page, uh, on slide 18. Uh, as Steve mentioned, our book is now weighted towards single family at 78% versus 20% of multifamily. On 1231, we had $1.5 billion of, of repo uh, against $2.4 billion of assets. Uh, looking at the end of the, the, the quarter, we ended with about um, a billion dollars of assets with uh, about $118 million of total securitization repo, which I'm going to get into in a second where a lot of the liquidity issues arose. That 118 million is net of restricted cash. On page 19, uh, where we're looking at here on the single family credit strategy, it starts with the uh, residential loans, which is our distressed loan uh, portfolio, where we've been purchasing subperforming uh, loans that had a, uh, uh, a checkered delinquency history in the past, uh, but showed elements of being able to continue paying on a mortgage loan with servicing oversight help. Uh, in that case, uh, we 
uh, you know, spend time with our servicer working on the borrowers and determining their servicing strategies uh, and, in, and looking at different ways we can maintain a borrower's current payment from uh, being, let's say, 30 to 60 days delinquent to being coming a current loan or a 12-month current loan, which it was, is the goal. Um, obviously, with respect to the uh, COVID-19 outcome and, and economic distress, you know, we're spending obviously more time with our servicers uh, ensuring that borrowers are getting the, the relief that they need and or just understanding the, the, the terms of their loans. Uh, so this is not an unusual strategy for us in working with borrowers that we've managed non-performing and sub-performing portfolios collectively for over 10 years um, on average uh, on our team. Uh, so we have, we, you know, with our calls with our services, we have designed strategies to meet the, 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 uh, the issues that have arose out of COVID-19. On the performing loan strategy, where uh, most of those assets other than outside of 94 million is related to scratch and dent loans, these are assets we've been purchasing at uh, you know, discounts to par uh, with respect to some kind of technical uh, issue at origination of that loan that was supposed to be sold to, a, uh, to either the agency or a non-agency conduit. Uh, in that case, with lower rates, we're seeing a pickup of, of prepayment rates uh, on our portfolio, which has been shortening the duration of our discount, which is actually uh, increasing the return of that asset class. Performance has been uh, has, been, has done well through this, this period as well on the performing side. Uh, on the security side, where I'm going to spend most of my time is where, the, where we saw a liquidity trap at the end of March. Lower prices uh, led to higher margin calls, led to more sales, led to lower prices, and onward. Uh, in that case, we saw an, uh, an opportunity to sell $405 million mostly in securities uh, to reduce our exposure to mark to mark liquidity, increase our liquidity against the margin calls. Today, uh, with on the security side, as I said earlier, with $118 million of total uh, repo balance outstanding after effect of restricted cash, our focus is going to be on looking at the, the close to billion dollars of unencumbered assets and looking to um, obtain term financing structures. Steve mentioned earlier that there was uh, a $900 million of potential term structures that we're looking at for our portfolio. Um, we have a number of uh, proposals out there, and we will be executing uh, a few in the, in the few week, next few weeks, uh, looking to reinvest those ca that cash into uh, assets that will have shorter duration, low LTV, and high coupon carry, which I'll talk about in a minute. Now, going over to page 20, uh, we're looking at this, the distressed loan strategies and, and, uh, and servicing strategy updates. Uh, again, our SPL characteristics, we have been focusing on buying loans in this space at low LTV, about 73%, um, with a high cash carry on coupon relative to the, the uh, conforming markets. Uh, in, in March, we actually saw the highest collections in our history of managing these types of loans, uh, which we started the year and uh, at the end of 2019 with an 18% increase in total borrowers that are paying uh, to in one quarter we had a 6% increase as of March 31st. Uh, after March, uh, in the uh, middle of March, we saw the largest print ever in job losses of 23.15 million, which is about 8.7 times what we saw in any four-week time period during the Great Financial Recession. We qu quickly went from uh, looking at some opportunities and refinancings and other strategies to shorten duration to more of a defensive posture and managing our loans for, for the uh, delinquencies that we would see given job losses and income losses altogether. Today, we have a, uh, well, as of March 31st, our portfolio had 7% COVID forbearance, uh, which is actually at that time was in line with um, the uh, Fannie and Freddie and GSC underlying forbearance rates around 6 to 7%. Uh, again, this is a sub-performing loan book. To, to be equal to a performing loan book in forbearance rates is, is, is quite, a, um, uh, quite an achievement. Fast forwarding to, to, to 4.30, we had 21% of loans that entered into for, forbearance relief plans. Uh, those loans, of those loans, uh, 55% or about 9.5% of, of the total loans were current in, the, uh, month, uh, in 2020. So while it's 21% looking further into the data, uh, it shows that only 9.5% of loans were current prior to COVID. Uh, so increasing our, our COVID forbearance rate from 7 to about 9.5%. Uh, 
Uh, again, we spend weekly calls with our servicers. We have design strategies for these types of outcomes. Um, it's going, the, the servicing industry is going to be under uh, a lot of pressure over the course of the next few months as those forbearance plans that were in place with respect to the CARES Act are where borrowers are calling and, and getting updates and finding, with, finding out if they're going to get extended or not. Um, in our strategies, we try to deal with the borrower uh, one by one and have design strategies for each borrower that are coming in and asking for relief. Uh, we think we don't see a one-size-fits-all strategy here with respect to servicing outcome. Uh, we are outside the CARES Act given these are private loans, and therefore we are able to you know, provide, we think, better relief efforts and longer-standing relief efforts for these borrowers. On page 20, now skipping over to multifamily, where 20% of our portfolio currently sits. Uh, we, as Steve mentioned, we sold out of our first loss position, uh, which was mostly the, the, the billion dollars of sales we did in, in, in the quarter. Uh, we delivered out of the, the first loss and, uh, and basically moved up the capital structure into the MES bonds that we own on our balance sheet, where we currently own today. Um, so in doing so, we... Um, we sold down about $800 million of POs, first loss positions, uh, and today we have a portfolio with, with a minimum of 7% credit support in that security line item of $268 million, 7% uh, credit support against a uh, portfolio of loans which were underwritten at origination by our multifamily team. We feel very comfortable with the exposure there, limited, at, limited exposure to, to, student fan, uh, to student housing. Uh, in, in fact, you know, when we look at the, the forbearance rates, it's a fraction of what we're seeing uh, from the multi, from the single family side, and this is due to uh, higher uh, uh, lease rollovers from um, from expectations, uh, as well as landlords that have actually proactively reached out to tenants and helped them with securing uh, government aid as it relates to um, job losses or, or or PPP plans, et cetera, as it relates to the CARES Act. So we think those efforts, uh, as well as you know, solid fundamentals in the multifamily space, has really helped keep the pay ratio high and, and the delinquency rates low on the, on the underlying loans. Going to page 22, uh, spending more time now on our direct loan exposure, where half of our, our uh, exposure is in multifamily space. Our direct, what we call direct exposure is um, loans to multifamily properties, uh, typically 150, 300 units. These are loans mostly in the south, southeast part of the United States uh, where uh, the underlying uh, borrower has, is, is taking out a senior loan with, with respect to likely Freddie Mac in the, in the average loan portfolio section box to the right. You can see that loan is around $29.8 million on average where we uh, provide a $6.2 million average MES loan or a PREF uh, to from a 68 LTV to an 82% LTV at our position. Uh, again, these are loans that are, that are two properties in mostly the south, south part of the east part of the United States, where we see the best demand uh, characteristics and migration from uh, from the northeast, particularly to those markets. Job losses uh, in those markets, we think, would will um, be given that the economies are, have already, in most cases, uh, have come back uh, with respect to um, uh, isolation measures. We think we'll have a faster return and, um, and we'll, uh, we'll outperform the Northeast markets with respect to, to multifamily. In, this, in our portfolio, we have um, 50 uh, mezzanine loans or PREF loans where we have one loan as of, uh, as of 430 that was in and as of today uh, that is in a state of uh, COVID forbearance. Um, you know, prior to, to up to 331, we didn't have any loans that uh, needed forbearance relief. We do have one loan today uh, that comprises roughly 1% of our portfolio. We're actively reaching out to our to, to the property managers and the sponsors on all these properties to get assessment of their uh, forbearance-related plans with respect to their tenants. Uh, to date, we've been surprised on the, the level of activity and and general performance underlying portfolios. Uh, this is an area that we will likely overweight with respect to the cash that we're raising from financing uh, in the near future. So it, the expectation here is that we will continue investing uh, into this asset class. Switch over to page 23 where we sold. This is the agency uh, exposure. Steve mentioned earlier we took advantage of the liquidity that was being uh, offered the market in our agency book. Uh, we sold off the, the position uh, to uh, delever, uh, increase liquidity, pay down margin calls. 
Um, today, this is an asset class that we we find challenged with respect to gen generating any meaningful return. As of uh, five eight, uh, the yield in this asset class was about one point one percent. You have a, a very short duration now in, the, in this market is being modeled out about one and a half years versus a five and a half year duration in, in January. Uh, so, with respect to uh, you know, while, while the interest rate volatility is definitely lower. There's now structural change that's coming to this market that people that will have to be analyzed that we've never seen before as it relates to COVID plans, forbearance relief, uh, and different measures FHFA may roll out for those particular for, for forbearance plans, whether those loans get bought out of the portfolio or stay in the portfolio will change the CPR rates. So these are additional factors that it'll be very hard to model. There's no real history on, on that, those, that type of activity. Um, and therefore, we think this, you know, this is definitely an asset class that we'll, we'll be underweighting. Um, we will continue using uh, the agency CMBS space as a incubator for cash uh, to the extent that we are looking to raise new capital and, and put into the market. Um, that is an area where we don't see negative convexity risk given the fact that the, the borrowers and the line uh, multifamily CMBS from Freddie Mac in particular are uh, locked out from any kind of uh, prepayment potential. So, then, so you know, the, the premium assets you can buy there uh, have, have durations that, are, that are well, um, can be well analyzed and modeled out. On page 25, uh, just looking at our, the outlook for, for the second quarter, um, we, obviously we're going to continue our credit focus uh, where we have ample and, and uh, experience looking at both distress uh, and delinquency and dislocation in both the multifamily and single family asset classes. Uh, in this market, we can target uh, higher discounts uh, and look for better upside with respect to the low rate environment. Uh, I mentioned earlier we were looking at some, uh, in particular, uh, short duration strategies in multifamily, uh, bridge loans, et cetera, where a, uh, a sponsor was likely going to take out a, a K series or a Freddie Mac uh, senior loan and looking at the underlying fundamentals may want to wait a year or two to take out that senior loan and lock them in for 10 years. That's an opportunity to provide bridge loan financing at high, uh, at low double digit uh, and total teens return opportunity to a 50, 65 LTV type of, of, of um, property uh, under a very short duration. Uh, in single family, we're finding value in the scratch and net markets can, uh, where we're looking at assets you know, with an $80 price, $88 handle dollar price, uh, where we see, you know, rates continue to come down and more prepayment optionality for those borrowers that are getting into, a, a, that were supposed to go into a Fannie Mae securitization, Freddie Mac securitization, and uh, did not make it because of, of a technical issue. So our ability to refinance those borrowers into a Fannie Freddie deal on the follow is something that we think will add value. Um, on, our, on our financial position, you know, given our... As Steve mentioned, our, our total leverage ratio uh, about 0.6 times, plenty of cash on balance sheet with unencumbered assets. We are, again, as we said, looking at different proposals for term finance, non-market market structures, where we can redeploy that capital into a market that has uh, opportunities in both single family and multifamily. Um, in, in, in that particular case, you know, the, the goal for us is to focus on credit in credit to look, focus on low LTV product where there's ample credit support protection to protect against, you know, a 20s some odd rate unemployment rate in this market. So uh, the prices in this market are definitely reflecting the, the unemployment rate that we've seen. Um, you know, different measures have, uh, and economists have looked at unemployment rate coming back from a 20s level to a 13 half to a even 11 half percent uh, uh, flat line over the course of 2021. So, the, you know, these are the types of scenarios that we have to abide by and look at when we're looking at uh, any of these, anything in the credit space to, to ensure that it has the downside protection uh, and being able to utilize our expertise in managing distress. So with that, I'll pass it over to Steve. Thanks, Jason. Operator, why don't we open it up for questions now? As a reminder to ask a question, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone to withdraw your question, press the pound key. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. Our first question comes from the line of Doug Harder from Credit Suisse. Your line is now open. Uh, thanks. Um, given, given the commentary you made around kind of uh, target asset mix, 
you know, what do you think, what type of leverage do you think your balance sheet um, can uh, sustain, you know, right now? And, you know, and kind of what should we think about about in terms of pacing to, to get there? Yeah, look, the going forward, I, I think all the all, all of us who are in credit, the credit market, are going to look to put more secure financing in place. So as we look at, as we, as Jason mentioned, we're in the process of, uh, working to get some of our over a billion dollars of unencumbered securities out on some longer term financing of 12 to 18 months non mark to market. So it's going to definitely be a, on a lower leverage amount, probably LTVs of 60 to 65 percent. So I would imagine at our 0.6 to 0.7 times longer term, we probably start to look like between one and one and a half times. Um, and that will depend on the ass- underlying assets. But as we, if we continue, as we, I think we are going to do, given the opportunities today, focus on more loan-oriented type investing, either direct lending or residential loan purchasing, they'll be combined with some kind of longer-term financing. So, again, given the kinds of advance rates we're seeing, my guess would be between one and one-and-a-half times. And kind of just, you know, I guess how should we think about the net interest margin you know, kind of in that environment, you know, just yep. trying to, you know, using one, one and a half t- turns of leverage and kind of backing into what that would mean from a, you know, an ROE kind of after the preferred dividend and after the, the expenses that's, you know, I, I guess just trying to figure out how that's, you know, what, what that sort of pencils out to and, you know, are there going to be other sort of fee income that you've generated in the past? Yeah, look, I think, you know, to some extent, selling some of the assets that we sold, the Freddie K. POs, for example, um, you know, if you think about the assets we did sell, we sold the agency, which was a lower-yielding, high-leverage strategy, and we sold the POs, which was obviously a high-yielding, lower-leverage, but still leverage strategy. Um, the, the net margin was 292 basis points. I think at the end, when we get done with it, we're going to be around the, the very similar neighborhood, 280 to 295 in basis points. Uh, and if you look at the, if you take the leverage out, um, keeping in mind that we have much lower cost of interest expense because of the lower leverage, I mean, I think we will still tr- move towards generating a high single digit, low double digit yield in this difficult environment. You know, as we get more comfortable and get more financing in place that's longer term and we understand the cost of that financing, which has changed substantially from our discussions that started to take place in the beginning of April to today, uh, it's probably come in three or 400 basis points. Um, you know, we, we're better able to judge what that looks like as we go into the end of the second quarter, into the third quarter. Great. Thanks, Steve. Sure. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Eric Hagen from KBW. Your line is now open. Hey, hey, gentlemen. Uh, good morning, and hope you guys are doing well. Hey, a few questions here. Um, on the preferred equity and MES debt side, were, were there marks on those positions during the quarter? And then on Absolutely. The, um, yeah, I, let me, I'll just kind of go through my questions. and Sure, okay. Um, yeah, and then on the three hundred million dollars in in, uh, in unrealized losses that you think are recoverable, uh, versus the three hundred and ninety something million that were unrealized taken during the quarter, can you just help us tie together the difference there? Um, sure. And it looks like maybe maybe the unrealized losses are sitting mostly in the Resi Credit portfolio, but can you get more specific on where those losses sit? And then finally, um, you guys noted that there were some settlements of sales uh, that took place. Um, post quarter end was there any impact on book value from that and what's the outlook for the dividend from here yeah so the first one on on, sure thanks eric uh on the first the question on on mark to market on the preferred so we account for the preferred in two different buckets one if it from an accounting standpoint qualifies as a loan it shows up as an individual line as a loan uh, and, and if it doesn't qualify as a loan, it shows up as an investment unconsolidated subsidiary. But across those two asset classes, there was about $9 million in unrealized losses. Those losses are calculated based on, you know, how you would go through any fair market valuation assessment. They're level three assets. 
we're looking at the current rates that preferreds are being issued at today in terms of our lending rates that we're active in the marketplace and our competitors, as well as the underlying properties. So it was about $9 million on that portfolio. Uh, as Jason pointed out, uh, there was only, today at April 30th, there's only one loan that's delinquent. It's $3 million of the 311. All of them are meeting their cash flow commitments to us so far. Um, and when you look at trying to reconcile the unrealized, and this is where gap accounting does, doesn't do favors to people who look at financial statements. So if you think about realized versus unrealized, realized is the difference between the amortized purchase costs and the sales price. And unrealized is where you last marked it to the amortized costs. So we end up with $300 million on the balance sheet, but as you can imagine, we were in a positive position on some of those asset classes. So as you transition from up 100 to down 300, that's where you generate your 400 or 396. Uh, and another part of the aspect of that 396 is the unwinding of the swap book where it showed that we had a $73 million realized loss, but that was offset by $43 million of unrealized losses previously taken, so really a net of 28. So the $300 million that ends up on the balance sheet is across the residential portfolio. Uh, and I think the best way to look at that, Eric, is if you look at the fair value table uh, in, when the 10Q is filed next week, it will lay out exactly where all those unrealized losses sit. I don't have that right in front of me, otherwise I'd give you the numbers, but I, I don't have it sitting in front of me, so I don't want to guess off the top of my head, but it will be disclosed Tuesday when we file the 10Q. Super. And then how about the, the impact on both? And then the sales, uh, yeah, as it relates to the, the sales. The dividend as well, Steve. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, the, the sales that took place in early April were really sales that we entered into at the end of the March on a trade day basis and just settled in the first week of April. And then as a dividend, you know, we are we continue to evaluate uh, the markets. Uh, we'd like to go through the June 1st uh, payment cycle to see the delta change in the COVID cash payment flows. But, you know, we, we're very hopeful that we'll be reinstating the dividends in the near future. Great. And not to be uh, too dense on the book value, but it sounds like no real meaningful impact um, from the end of the quarter on book value. No, I mean, look, we, we know from the other people that have come out and announced, uh, there's several REITs that have come out and said their book values are up. Look, there's no question the securities portfolio is up. Uh, there's, there's no question that some of our other asset classes have improved. Liquidity started to improve in terms of you're starting to see two-way flows of, of securities and, and loan transacting, securitizations being done. Uh, you know, we're still continuing to evaluate the residential loan market as it relates to forbearance. So we would prefer not to go out. While we feel comfortable that the book value is higher, we don't really want to put a number on what, how much higher it is. Got it. Thank you so much, and have a nice holiday weekend. Thanks, Eric. You too. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Jules Kirsch from Jules P. Kirsch. Your line is now open. Good, good morning, gentlemen. Um, I, hope, I hope you do have an enjoyable weekend. Um, my, my question concerns the likelihood going forward of further margin calls. Has that exposure changed, and if so, in what direction? Yeah, look, I mean, look, just from the mere fact that we've almost taken $1.7 billion of liabilities off the balance sheet, that in itself has reduced the margin calls. Uh, which was one of the goals of the company. Uh, we we have one we have one non-agency security can, out on the repo, uh, which has been marked down uh, significantly, and we believe the marks on that portfolio represent are probably lower than where the actual price of the security is today. So we don't we don't foresee significant margin calls on that in the future. And then the remaining part of our borrowings on our residential loan portfolio which has been marked to where we think represent market clearing levels on the loan side. So while there can, there can be additional margin calls, we don't think we're in a situation where we'll have significant amounts of margin calls that put the company under distress again unknowingly. Thank you. Sure. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Stephen Laws from Raymond James. Your line is now open. Hi, good morning, Steve. Good to, good to hear from you guys. Hope everyone is doing well. Um, 
wanted to, to follow up, maybe I apologize if I missed a comment, but a question earlier, somewhat around the dividend, but really more taxable income. You know, I think one of the, uh, the uh, in the release was $170 million of unrealized gain reversal. Uh, was that in taxable income and has been distributed? Where does that leave you from a, a distribution requirement standpoint? And from a taxable income basis, how do we think about what is losses on security sales where they're floored at zero and can't offset ordinary income versus what's normal course of business and can offset ordinary income from the portfolio to, to drive that taxable income? That's a very good question, Steve. Um, you know, we, we obviously when we look at our, our taxable distribution requirements for the year, it's a yearly requirement that we have to meet. And so when we, decide, when we suspended the dividend, that was 100% related to meeting near, near-term liquidity concerns. And as we go forward and set our dividend policy, obviously we're going to take all those into consideration. But as we sit today, you know, we feel confident that given where we think when we reinstate the dividend and our ability to generate the uh, return to cover those dividends, we won't have any significant mismatch of, of what's, what we're required to pay and what we are paying. Okay, thanks for that color, and, and I know you can have to – still early in the year with, for dividend right. commentaries. I understand that. Um, yep. You know, to think, to think about cash flows a little more and, and just interest income on the loan portfolio, I appreciate the, the reconciliation of the 7% at the, that, that's maybe 95 roughly, uh, I believe Jason said at the end of April. You know, where do you – do you have any thoughts on where that goes, or, or can you give us a color on the geographic – uh, uh, footprint of, of those loans, and then as they do go into some uh, forbearance plan, how, how does that work with regards to accruing interest? Do you accrue interest for, say, 90 days or a certain period of time on your income statement, or, or does it not run through the income statement once it, it starts taking forbearance? Yeah, so on the servicing side, um, you know, the you know, overall what we're seeing is a market that's going to trend to about a 20% forbearance rate. Uh, and that, in, you know, in, in totality uh, on the non-agency side of the equation, uh, including new performing loans that were originated in 2019, we think that number is going to be in the 20s. Um, you know, our portfolio at a 20% plus, uh, you know, uh, COVID you know, relief plan effort, which most of those loans, 55% of those loans were uh, already delinquent prior to the COVID plans. Um, we're giving them extra relief uh, without, you know, pursuing foreclosure measures, et cetera. Um, you know, we, we think we're going to continue to see that increase. We think we've seen the, the largest increase to date in that uh, in, the, in the last monthly cycle in April. Um, we have seen a number of borrowers that have made payment after the COVID plan has been in place for a one-month deferral. And remember, uh, our servicing strategies do not just simply have to offer a six-month or 12-month forbearance. We're also looking at month-to-month uh, deferrals as well um, to, to ensure that the borrower, uh, can, you know, is not being put into a situation where you know, he won't be able to access credit in the future, such as a, a refinance with a longer date forbearance. I mean, what's, what what, what um, you've, everybody has read is that the as a loan goes into forbearance, the, the payment disruption is not reported to the credit bureaus. But what is uh, uh, it is reported is the fact that the bar went into forbearance. So having a forbearance on your credit actually uh, does limit your capability of of, uh, of accessing. Uh, uh, a refinance at lower rates, so we're very careful not to, uh, you know, have that be um, a headwind against the bar and, his, and lowering his overall payment uh, in accessing record low mortgage rates, which we expect to see over the course of the next six months. Um, so that that is on a case by case basis, and again, we we do expect that number to increase, but uh, you know, we think we've seen the largest increase to date in in the month of March. Uh, sorry, month of April. Um, you know. As you can see in our portfolio, uh, we bought these loans uh, with a, you know, a number of these loans already delinquent uh, from, from this, the start. We are working with a loan servicer uh, and servicers that have uh, vast experience and, you know, in, in, in one of our larger services, dedicated personnel to our servicing book. So we're not taking a performing loan uh, servicing strategy and, and trying to figure out forbearance related to relief plans. We've been active conversation with a number of these borrowers you know, for over a year, and, you know, the, the conversations continue through these forbearance plans. So, um, you know, we, we have borrowers that understand the relief efforts that our, our service has been provided to them, uh, and we have, a, we have a servicing 
team that is w was um, basically selected and built to deal with uh, with a high level amount of delinquent loans. So we feel pretty comfortable about our ability to service through this environment. Uh, obviously, you know it, the, the the question of total uh, delinquencies will be a function of uh, total job losses and where those job losses are. Your question earlier is where our portfolio on a footprint. We have a national you know footprint portfolio. We have underweighted. Um, portfolios in selection in the northeast part of the United States uh, for a number of years, uh, simply related to for, you know the foreclosure uh, delinquent the foreclosure timelines that are associated in a market like New York that could take up to five years to pursue a foreclosure. Uh, we we uh, all in buying our portfolio, we uh, are looking at loans that are more aligned with us in the fact that we have a 70-ish you know percent LTV. Uh, so there's plenty of equity in those loans for borrowers to you know, want to keep uh, access to that equity. Uh, going through forbearance or delinquency just reduces the LTV or the borrower's uh, equity position, uh, and that's uh, something that they want to avoid as well uh, as us. So again, we're aligned in, in these relief plans and um, and do expect to un, you know to have uh, to outperform the market as a whole and potentially even the agency market with respect to their forbearance relief plans on on 100% performing loan portfolio. Great. Thanks Steve, for that the, color. The, the last part of your question about the accrual, you know, if, it, if, if they go into the forbearance plan, we would stop accruing immediately. Typically, you do 90 days and then you stop, but if somebody's going into a plan, we, d we would stop accruing at that point. Right. And they that's, go to the cash basis. I think my model. Yeah, that's, that's great to, uh, as I think about my model to, to have that clarified. Yeah. Uh, Last question, if you don't mind. Uh, really appreciate no, the sure. disclosure of the deck and, and the financial tables. I wanted to ask one on page 14 regarding the investment portfolio. Um, given the shift in mix, should we expect that yield on average earning assets to go up without the agency assets? Have these been historically adjusted to remove the, the impact of the lower yearling agency securities? Or how, how do we think about yield on average interest earning assets going forward yeah. without the agency MBS? Yeah, I mean, if you so we, we we really sold two large blocks of assets: the low yielding agency portfolio and the higher yielding Freddie K first loss POs. And so, interestingly enough, when you take out those two portfolios, the net margin overall for the company doesn't change significantly. I would, I you know, I, I did the calculations. We've obviously done the calculations forward. Um, and I would say it's going to be within 10 to 15 basis points of where we were last quarter, first quarter, 292, as we sit right. today. That, that's good, Tyler. I know, I know you mentioned the, the stable spreads during your prepared remarks, but I wasn't sure if things were, were yeah. both shifting up. No, no, that's – yep, yep. Great. Thanks a lot, Steve and Jason. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Christopher Nolan from Landenberg Thalman. Your line is now open. Hey guys. Um, so on the comments, on the comments that you guys made in terms of ramping up to a high single digit, low double digit ROE, um, what should we expect for the next couple of quarters? I mean, should you be able to achieve somewhere in that range in the second quarter, third quarter? Yeah. I mean, Chris, look, I think you know the difficulty of, of coming down with with a very specific ramp on where and when we're going to get there. Uh, really, I mean, one of the reasons why we've hesitated to reinstate our dividend is we want to get our, our handle around this June 1st cycle of uh, mortgage payments that come through with the borrowers. And exactly as these states start to reopen, how is the economy reacting and how quickly do we think it's going to happen? So, you know, as we go and put down um, this longer-term funding against our unencumbered portfolio that will give us some excess cash, that will, you know, as we start to reinvest some of that cash, we'll get a better sense of exactly when we think we're going to meet those goals. Um, so we don't really at this point want to put a timeline, a specific timeline on that. Great. And then on the mezzanine for the direct lending, um, oh, Jason, do you have a uh, on the mezzanine part for the direct lending, um, you know, you're, you're sort of in a position on the capital structure for your, you know, your borrowers, which, you know, going into a credit down cycle, I think, for multifamily. I mean, how do you guys look to limit your losses on that? Well, the, the, the loans are structured um, as more of a short duration type of opportunity. The, the, the premise of the borrower taking the loan was that there were some capital improvements, um, management uh, issues that were underlying that property when the, the, the new 
uh, sponsor took it over. Uh, so there's an expectation there that you know you'd have cash flow improvement on the line property, and then that loan could be um, refinanced out. Our mezzanine loan could be refinanced out with a agency supplemental. Uh, you have to remember that the multifamily market um, is backstopped by by the uh, Fannie and Freddie uh, multifamily lending, senior lending. So there's plenty of liquidity on the senior loans that exist in that market. Part of the crisis that we've seen uh, in the securitization space uh, and residential loans is the fact that lending disappeared. Uh, so your you know your ROA your ROE return uh, now became the same return but on an ROA basis, and that basically brought the price down you know 20 25 points in some cases. So um, with where there is still lending and still active uh, financing, uh, you have not seen price you know declines to that extent, uh, and this is one of those cases the multifamily space where this where senior lending is still you know is uh, is basically backed off by Fannie and Freddie. Uh, in our case, we're mostly folk, you know, our, our assets, given the size of our assets, are mostly supported by senior loans from Freddie Mac. So to the extent that um, you know, their management plan went in place, uh, uh, you know, there's a potential supplemental that could be taken out. But, you know, overall we've seen cash flows, you know, we, we've seen cash flows um, be uh, are pretty stable uh, with respect to these assets. Again, our portfolio is mostly in the south, southeast part of the United States. So, um, you know, with a one loan delinquency uh, as of today, uh, you know, we, we are seeing very stable trends through that market. Um, uh, obviously, unemployment rate benefits and, and triple P benefits have been helpful to the underlying tenants. Um, we, we are supported by a, you know 82% LTV uh, on those loans, and you know, to the extent our portfolio just wasn't originated, obviously, this month, we have. Uh, a, a seasoning in these loans where the LTV is actually uh, decreased due to a you know, six six and a half percent increase in property value prices or more, given the location of these assets. Again, in the south southeast part of the United States, where you've had um, uh, uh, a lot of uh, appraisal of up to high single digits in, in these markets on an annualized basis. So we feel uh, comfortable about our position. We feel um, comfortable about our sponsors. Uh, the part of the reason the loans that we provide, the reason why we provide these loans to these sponsors, is that they're well-capitalized sponsors. They're not sponsors that come in with one loan opportunity and and uh, you know are not comfortable or don't know how to run a building. Uh, they're seasoned uh, veterans in the space that have ample liquidity, ample access to the Fannie Freddie pipe uh, securitization financing channels. So um, you know we think that the, the the liquidity and the sponsors are strong. The underlying assets have improved. Uh, could we see increases in delinquencies with tenants, et cetera? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, there are reserves, uh, interest reserves built into these loans as well. Um, and, you know, there, there are uh, various mechanisms that the, the senior lending uh, forbearance plans will allow. Uh, Freddie Mac, as part, you know, is looking at, you know, up to, 100, up to 90, 120 days of forbearance for the landlords, which obviously will create income and, and help, um, you know, support that landlord if he has any, any liquidity issues. So, uh, you know, we're not expecting a a large increase of delinquencies in this space, given the you know where the bars where the where the assets are located and, and the sponsors that support them. And Chris, we, one of the reasons we like this asset class is given the uh, the legal protection that we have in the sense that the senior is sitting at 68% LTV, we're sitting at 82% LTV, and to the extent they don't meet the terms of our loan, we can take over the property. So there's a significant amount of equity in the property that we think that protects us, and it has protected us, protected us historically. Uh, we have one exposure to a, a student housing, it's a very small amount uh, as a portfolio. Uh, which is probably the, the, the probably the highest concern right now, and the one loan that's in the, the forward delinquency was a loan that w has had issues from a property manager operation standpoint. It's more poor execution as opposed to a bad property. So, while they've chosen a, a COVID forbearance plan because that's what the markets allow them to do, it is something that we're watching. But we don't have right now as we sit, we feel very good about the properties. Uh, and they continue to perform above the expectation, given where, given what they could be performing. Yeah, my concern would be not so much the LTV; it's more the debt service coverage that these guys have after they, you know, pay off their first lien mortgage. That's right. Well, yes, and and part of the protection is look, they, there's no cash distribution out until all of our payments are made. So there is a cash trap within these structures, which is helpful to entice them to make sure that they get these things back cash flowing properly so they can 
take cash out of the property. But look, that's why most of our loans are the seniors are Freddie or Fannie. And as Jason said, there is programs from both those institutions to lend money to let them help them meet their cash flow requirements. Great. Thanks, guys. Sure. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Matthew Holit from Nomura. Your line is now open. Oh, hey Jason, hey Steve, thanks for taking my question. Uh, look, I mean, it's a monumental. If you get the financing, then it's going to be a lot of cash. And I think if I hear you correctly, you're going to sort of deploy it slowly and see how things go. I, I, I want to sort of put it out there with if you do reinstate the preferred and common, then you can buy, obviously, you can look at sort of various parts of your capital stack. I mean, is that something that you'll, you'll look at uh, when you look at sort of capital deployment options? Oh, no, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, Matt. I mean, I think the question is, you know, as we, as we, as we look forward to opportunities and we think about our business model, um, we, we need to figure out ways to create longer term financing structures that eliminate or reduce the mark to market exposure, which going into March, we thought we were low levered, which we were at one and a half times. But with over, you know, at the beginning of March, we had over a billion dollars of unencumbered assets, but we still were unable to, we still had difficulty in meeting margin calls, and so therefore we reduced the portfolio. But as we go forward uh, and raise in, and get additional capital, that those returns of those incremental investments are going to be driven towards reinstating the dividend and cut, making sure that we cover the dividend with cash. Got it. And then just when I look at the model, going forward I mean, you guys have always had you know this that, that interest margin and also realized gains and you know sort of part of the, that mpl right. i mean that's still going to be part of the core model right sort of looking at it going forward these gains you take on these whole loans and uh, other strategies that's right no that that's right i mean i that, that's absolutely right look i mean part of the 300 million dollars of unrealized loss sitting on the balance sheet right. You know, there's going to be some recovery of that unrealized, and that's going to be an aspect of everybody's income in the REIT sector. Um, our, our, our direct lend generates fees that will always be part of our income, uh, and uh, you know, we will continue to invest in assets that we think are distressed that give us a chance for capital appreciation. It will never be just a 100% net spread model. That's just not our core DNA, and, you know, we think there's better opportunities in buying, you know, distressed opportunities. Right, it certainly has always uh, never been entirely part of it. And then on the residential transitional loans, did you comment on anything that's left in the portfolio? What you look at, uh, how you look at that market today, where the opportunities could be, or is there something that you, know, you see value and opportunities elsewhere? Do you mean fix and flip? Yes. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah, so you know, the fix and flip market, um, we, we have underweighted that. We have roughly $90 million exposure there. On a performing in, in that performing loan category, um, and we've underweighted it simply because of the refinancing that was happening in those underlying pools uh, in the fix and flip market that was taking a lot of the borrowers out um, out of the fix and flip loan into a 30-year loan invest in the non-QM market. Now, with the non-QM market essentially closed, there's definitely going to be more pressure on on the underlying uh, borrowers there to to, to make payment. Um, you know, Obviously, selling houses is, is more difficult in this environment. So, you know, we think there's going to be more extensions on the fix and flip market. I think eventually, um, you know, that will play itself out in the very near term, uh, where extensions will increase. You know, some odd, probably beyond 20% to 30% ratios, if not more. And then the question is, uh, what happens to those properties after that? Um, you know, we we have, you know, we we are very confident in our abilities to take over properties um, to. to Manage properties, whether it's rental cash flows or into a to, into a sale. Um, you know, I, I see more of a distressed. Uh, I see uh, two options there: a distressed option uh, to buy uh, delinquent uh, loans in that space, uh, where th th there's lack of servicing from an originator that didn't have the servicing personnel to manage a 20 or 30 percent delinquent book, um, where you can uh, transfer servicing uh, and basically utilize our servicing capability that we we've built up um, to do that. And the other side is that you're going to see more bridge loan opportunities in the space, shorter duration, uh, hard money financing, if you will, uh, to very strong sponsors, which could also provide an opportunity for us. Um, in those cases, in the past, you you know you'd take a um, a seven-ish percent type of net net uh, coupon and, and you lever that uh, you know one times or so with what the market was doing. Uh, today, um, you know you can do that on a lever base and still generate a double-digit return. Which is obviously attractive. The question is, you know, tracking that sponsor and their ability to move the asset or rental 
or, or rent the asset, so ensuring that, that the cap rates and those markets are supportive of, of the debt that you're taking. So, uh, again, high coupon uh, debt, you know, that it, some of that um, will have to be in a form of a flip. So we're, we're evaluating it. We know, we know the players in the space. We, there's large portfolios that have been marketed out for sale uh, in the hundreds and millions of range um, that we've been tracking, and uh, you know, we think that there may be a better opportunity down the line from here than today. Yeah, it sounds like you guys have really a really ton of different opportunities. And, and last question, I might as well throw it in there. You guys, you know, really one of the few reservoirs that managed successfully through the financial crisis. You got through it. You came out very strong on the other end. Just any broad comments in terms of this cycle versus what you saw during that cycle and, and you know, uh, sort of how you're going to position the company today versus what you did last time around. Just many broad thoughts. Thank you. Appreciate it. You're talking about the 08 cycle versus this cycle? Correct. Yeah, I, look, I think the, the problem with the cycle today is I think, you know, we're still in the middle of it, right? I mean, we have massive amounts of people out of jobs. Uh, the, the, the hope is as we get to reopening these economies, a large percentage of those people go back to work immediately, and we see the unemployment drop significantly. Um, you know, but we need to see that first before we try to figure out exactly how we're going to come out of this thing. So I think these opportunities are going to continue to unfold over the summer and into early fall, um, and that's why we are hesitant, Matt, to put out specific guidance of where we think the opportunities are going to be. But, you know, I, I think the big difference here is you, you had a you had a over-levered, over-priced assets and, and debt in 2008 on almost every single asset category. Today, it's really being driven right now just by the social distancing and stay at home, where the economies have literally shut down. So the asset price deterioration, we don't know where it's going to end up yet. And, um, and it's, a, it's a going to be a factor and function of how much government support is going to be pumped into the economy, both to consumers and businesses, and how quickly we can reopen and or get a vaccine to get the place back to whatever the new normal is going to be. Uh, I'll further add that there's a little bit of differences in asset selection and, and where the stress is in the system. So, you know, in 2008, um, the average borrower, you know, in this non-QM non, uh, space, you know, had a, over 100 LTV. Um, today, a lot of the financing that was done was at lower levels. Uh, you, you can see it today in, in, in home sales, uh, homes on the market for sale. You're at basically three and a half months of supply. Um, that number jumped, you know, to over 10 months of supply. Uh, quickly in 2009 uh, in, in into 10, um, so you know, you're not seeing the stress on the supply side. Uh, you actually have a contraction of homes on the market, and again, there was a home shortage to begin with prior to COVID, and now that it's, it's exacerbated by the lack of um, assets that are on the market. Uh, so you, you know, in some markets, you may see uh, you know home price appreciation because of that, or in some markets where the, you know there's uh, still uh, COVID. Uh, related shutdowns, you, you, know, you may see double-digit type of declines, particularly in the service sector, um, and particularly in markets like Las Vegas, where you know, the economy is supported by the service sector, and you have you know, massive amounts of unemployed employed borrowers. Um, the other side of the coin is that uh, the asset over the last eight years that performed the best has been basically the smaller, lower-dollar um, properties across the market, uh, where you, know, you, you can earn a higher coupon and and um, and finance those assets at similar rates. Uh, in this environment, where with respect to job losses and again in the service sector, uh, versus other markets like inf information technology um, uh, or uh, sectors like that, you know you've had basically one third of the job losses in information technology in the service sector. So economies that are supported by uh, by those types of economies, you, you will see, you know see better results and better results in the middle. Um, uh, in middle price range of, of houses, so you'll, you'll the, you know the simply looking at you know Ginny May versus Freddie Mac uh, doing, uh, forbearance ratios, you're seeing basically a two to three x increase. You know, um, you'll, I believe you'll see about two to three x of forbearance plans in the Ginny May space versus the um, Freddie Mac space, and you'll see a, a, an increase of supply in the lower income housing or lower. Uh, price range than you would see in the mid price range because of this. Before it was across the board in all asset classes, across all um, uh, uh, tiers of price, of price uh, of home prices, and today I think that you'll see more, more exacerbated distress in the lower income, lower price range. 
great information. Have a great long weekend, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Jason Stewart from Jones Trading. Your line is now open. Hey, good morning. Thanks. Uh, Jason, on the forbearance comments, I'm going to make sure I understood correctly, 9.5% of the forbearance, um, uh, I guess, structures today were current and are now in forbearance. The rest were at some form of delinquency and are in forbearance. Is that the right way to think about that? Yeah. And when you, in your comment, um, can you give us the average term of the forbearance agreement, if you don't mind? Yeah, so we were, we've were we elected to do um, more deferments than forbearance, and that's simply because um, the, the borrower will have more liquidity in his mortgage loan, you know, after effect of COVID-related uh, shutdowns than a forbearance. Um, you know, if, if the GSC has just last week passed through um, – uh, new servicing regs, and uh, that was that establishes that borrowers after forbearance will go into deferment. We're already doing that now, so we, we thought that was a better model from the beginning, and which is why we elected to go through uh, deferment. Um, and it adds less stress on the servicer uh, as well to, to track it. Uh, it also because our borrowers, uh, you know, often speak to our servicing per- the servicing personnel that are that the, that is allocated to that loan. Um, this also creates, you know, kind of a monthly dialogue on what, what's happening, uh, and so we can design a longer-term structure if necessary. Um, so some of these borrowers didn't, even, you know, obviously didn't know the extent of their job loss or income loss, uh, and, and so you know it'd be hard for us to say that three months, six months, nine months, or twelve months is appropriate. So taking a month-to-month um, type of approach we thought was a better result, and then structuring into what could be a more of a long-term solution once. Uh, you know, the effects of uh, the COVID-19 economy has is, is been uh, fed, uh, impacted and, and overcome. So, um, yeah, so, so again, forbearance is, is not utilized to the same extent it is on the Fannie Freddie uh, portfolios that you see out that, that's been reported. Uh, and in the case of deferments, it, it is a month-to-month, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, forbearance, if you will. Okay, and I would expect that part of that plan is to keep contact rates up. And I think to your comment, I just want to make sure I understood this correctly. You think that at the end of this cycle, we'll back, we're, we, we will be in this portfolio back to pre-COVID payment levels? Is that what what you're characterizing this this plan as an ultimate outcome? Yeah, I mean, look, there's going to be it's, it's going to bifurcate. Um, we have loans at four and a half percent, four point seven eight percent coupons. You know, the, the uh, the, the refinance market today is, will likely approach 3%, if not lower. Uh, so there's substantial, you know, uh, spread for these borrowers to, to, to refinance into to, to achieve lower financing costs, which is, you know, one of our goals. And so that will that will be on one side of the, of the equation where borrowers are not long-term impacted uh, with with, the, with COVID-related distress and can continue paying and take advantage of lower rates. And we want to avail our borrowers to that that outcome. Uh, on the other side, there will be borrowers that you know will not be able to continue paying, lost a job, uh, or have some kind of permanent um, you know damage in their in their fiscal uh, side of the equation. So, you know, those are situations we're going to have to work out with uh, with the, with the other loss mit plans we have in place, such as you know deed and lose or short sales to avoid foreclosure. Um, to the extent we could rent back the property to those borrowers, you know, at, 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 we will assess that as well, um, which are all plans we put in place after 2010. You know, managing you know tens of thousands of mortgage loans uh, that were in non-performing loan space. So, uh, you know, we you, know, the, you have to assess whether the borrower has the ability or not, and then put the borrower into the right plan when that assessment is done. We just believe it was too early in March to make that determination up front, which is why we, we want the high contact ratio, and we think it serves the servicer and the borrowers better by by over communicating. Understood. Okay, and then one one high level question: When you think about Term financing, and, and I don't need to. I don't need details on what you're currently discussing. But generically, at a high level, over the medium term, what does term financing look like for structured credit and the mezzanine part of the capital structure? And what impact, more specifically, do you think that has over time on asset prices? Um, I would imagine loss-adjusted yield is one component. But if you could remove that and just talk about the impact um, of what financing looks like and the impact on on asset prices uh, over over time, that would be helpful. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we expect asset price to improve as these term structures are more utilized across the market. Again, in, in March, you basically lost repo financing across the entire securitization market. Uh, when I say lost, you, you know, you had obviously margin calls, but also inability to add assets uh, onto facilities to meet margin calls. 
uh, at, you know, in the thick of it in March, you know, the counterparties wanted cash or treasuries uh, and did not want to increase their book uh, with respect to new assets to meet margin calls. So there was a complete shutdown of the securization market. A lot of these mezzanine asset classes were were sold uh, with the with the with, with the concept of taking repo leverage against these assets to generate a double digit return in the mez space. So when you lose the financing, you have to back you know uh, back out the the price decline to get to generate a double digit return. And that's what you saw in the market. In, in March and into April. Um, so as the term financing structure more, more utilized, you do expect prices to um, to to, re, uh, to increase. We've already seen, uh, you know, since 331, a, a pretty more meaningful increase in asset prices in the security space, uh, which was the most distressed part of the market, um, uh, and, and it's due to, to financing proposals out there. I'd also mention that, you know, financing proposals, We've we've seen financing proposals from from a number of counterparties. We've evaluated uh, a number of proposals, and you know, initially the proposals were fairly expensive in, in March and into April. We we took a stance of waiting for you know better clearing levels once uh, a you know some of the um, some players were were selling out large positions and need emergency financing. Uh, you know since that is cleared um, for the most part, you know we've seen level we've seen pricing you know come down uh, from high single digits on on these type of portfolios to you know mid uh, mid single digit type of, of financing costs so um, we, you know I think we were rewarded by waiting and we were only able to wait because we didn't have the, the same you know we didn't have a, a cash liquidity issue you know into April which would have forced us to take that financing at these type these uh, at the higher level so we had the ability to be patient with the financing use it opportunistically uh, which we've done, and um, you know, we will likely put one in place shortly, uh, and you know, it likely will be in that mid, you know, type of range, single-digit um, yields, uh, with you know, advance rates, and you know, anywhere from 55 to 75 percent, depending on the asset and the securization type. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of John Evans from SG Capital. Your line is now open. Can you just talk a little bit about maybe in the medium term or longer term how you kind of view the capital structure now um, with where you are, where you want to get to from a leverage standpoint relative to kind of the preferreds, et cetera? Do you, do you expect to get more term financing and not raise more preferred debt? Do you, can you just talk about your guys' thought process? It seems relatively expensive now. Yeah, I mean, look, I think given where the stock's trading, both preferred and common, you know, we're, we're, we have no interest in going and accessing the market at these levels. Uh, I think we feel like to the extent that we can get longer-term structured finance against the assets that we're investing in, that's going to be the way that we're going to focus in the, in the foreseeable future, right? I mean, I think if you look historically what the company's done accessing – the equity and preferred markets. It's been when we can raise accretive capital, and you know we we got we want to get a we've got to get our stock price back closer to where book value should be before you even contemplate that. And you know our preferreds are trading in the uh, 16 to 18 dollar range. That doesn't make any sense to go out and do you know 10 percent or 11 percent preferred. So I think we have better access to lower costing capital and structures loan structures than we do in the actual equity capital markets. And from a, a ratio of preferred to common, you know, we have $2 billion of equity um, and we have about $500 million of preferred, so one and a half. You know, obviously we took the $700 million hit to our common side, so, you know, the, the preferred is a little bit larger percentage, but, you know, we, we've also, the dividend of the preferred and dividend of the common are closely track each other. So it's... Uh, one is not that much more creative or, or, or destructive right now as we sit here today. And we need to reinstate all the dividends before we get a better sense of cost of capital where our stock starts to perform after we reinstate the dividend. And then just relative, I know it's a board decision in, in, in the future, but uh, some of your peers have, have paid their, their common dividend with stock. Is that something that you guys look to do to preserve uh, cash? You know, we right now that's not a consideration, uh, especially when our stock's trading at less than 50% of book value. Um, we, we don't need to do that, and we would prefer not to reinstate a dividend with dilutive stock issuance. Uh, we'd rather wait until we feel comfortable that we can meet all the dividend requirements in cash 
which I, like we've said on the call, that we hope that's in the near term. Okay. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. No, thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Douglas Colkett from NH Holdings. Your line is now open. Okay, hi. Two quick and relatively simple questions. The first one, on the balance sheet, you have $2 million of equity, as you said, and you show $2.7 million of liabilities, but yet you say there's a 0 0.6 leverage rate, ratio. I'm just wondering which of those liabilities you're disregarding. Yeah, well, so the liabilities, there's a lot of securitized debt on our balance sheet. Um, so we're only, when we, when we define, if you look at the definitions back in the glossaries and in, in the notes on a particular page is where the, the leverage ratio is calculated, we use what's called callable debt. And so uh, let's see, if you go to page 12 on the presentation, um, that's, you know, and, and you look at the financing, we're really just reflecting the debt that we think that, that is callable in nature in the portfolio side. The $1.4 billion of debt is really what we consider callable. Uh, the other debt that's in the balance sheet on the, in the, in the balance sheet statement is securitized debt, which truly doesn't have any callback to the company or requirements. So it's, it's collateralized by very particular assets that are in a structure that doesn't have any risk back to the company. Well, following up on that, though, isn't that the same way you classified the multifamily loans in the past, the $17.8 million that you ended up having to liquidate? That's right. That's right. The $17.8 billion of multifamily debt was related to securitizations, and if you look at our balance sheet today, we don't have any of that. That's all gone. Okay? And so the, the liabilities that are left that are securitized debt um, is we have uh, $1 billion of residential securitized debt, and another thirty one point zero three four billion and thirty eight million dollars. So the total of those two is about a billion about a billion one in securitized debt that's not has no call back to the company. So were there no margin calls then on that seventeen point eight billion previously? No, no, none, zero. They weren't involved in margin calls. Okay, you just liquidated that to help meet other the other margin. Well, the POs, so the $17 billion is related to the structure that the securities were issued off of. The POs that we actually owned, we add them out on repo. That was marked to market and was receiving margin calls, and that's one of the, that's one of the asset classes we elected to sell to reduce those margin calls. Okay. Second quick question. With regard to the multifamily second uh, mortgage positions where Fannie and Freddie or, or Jenny or whatever are senior, if they go into a uh, forbearance agreement, is NYMT's second uh, position loan payable at that point or not payable? Or are they forced also into forbearance? They are forced into forbearance, but what does happen is the, the property itself is cash-trapped, and so they need to come current with our forbearance interest prior to taking any cash out of the, out of the, um, out of the structure. And right now... We only have one property that's in a senior forbearance, which is the one that we're in forbearance on. And then they're in senior uh, forbearance. What, the, the cash is obviously, I mean, obviously these properties still generate cash. That cash that's right. is... Well, well, that's well, typically, happens. yeah, typically what happens is, obviously the reason they're going to the agencies to ask for forbearance is they have a higher percentage of renters not paying rent. Um, which is not the case so far in our portfolio, but in the case where it does happen, and they're asking for relief, um, but the money that they receive on their rents is distributed forward. It's just it's just a net number that they're being lent to cover their DSCR requirements for the, the month. They're not getting lent the entire amount of rental income for the month. They're getting the, they're getting lent the amount of money that fixes that essentially fills up the bucket. And, and that, that additional lending then is senior to NYMT's second mortgage position? That's right. But the way that lending is currently structured from the, the agencies is that is a loan for a short, for a 12-month period that they need to repay. So, they so I think that's one reason why many of I think that's one reason why many of them have, have elected not to take it. I mean, it's just it's a 12-month mandate, but doesn't really solve their problem. So, I think many of these sponsors have liquidity to meet the needs so far, 
And so I think they look at the the, the cost of that debt uh, for forbearance versus their other liquidity options, and, and, and that's where they're making the decisions. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Mark Devries from Barclays. Your line is now open. Yeah, thanks. Um, appreciate this may be a difficult question, but of the – you know, the 23% hit the book you took in the quarter from unrealized losses that you're, uh, you know, optimistic you'll get back. Do you have a sense for how much of that is due to, you know, the market pricing and higher defaults and how much of it is higher discount rates? And also just how are you thinking about, you know, what the market is pricing in from a default perspective relative to, to, to what you expect? I'm just trying to get a better sense of, of how much of that could ultimately come back to you either through reversal of marks or just realized cash flows. Yeah, I mean, the, the initial hit the, the market took on these prices was a function of lack of financing and then also forced sales, which then caused more markdowns uh, and then uh, more selling. So that, that, that negative feedback loop that was created uh, in March um, you know, was basically the, the uh, you know, more of a technical decline. Um, so that, that initially brought prices down. Now, um, as, you know, the markets go back to work in some communities and, and you know, stay-at-home measures are in others, the market is evaluating, you know, the um, the unemployment rate and you know, the credit side of the equation. Uh, you know, through the last month, obviously, we've gotten a lot of reporting on unemployment rate uh, per market and uh, what the you know governor's plans are per state. Uh, we've had increases across the board in in the asset classes in the securitization spec- sector, simply because of the uh, the modeling done on on unemployment rate uh, was was only a, a fraction of the, the losses of. Uh, taken on the bonds relative to the liquidity issues that were experienced due to a lack of financing. So as I mentioned earlier, with financing channels coming back more in term structure orientation versus monthly mark-to-market um, uh, repo, uh, you know, we, we do expect prices to, to increase um, to withstand, uh, you know, to, for, um, to back into basically an ROE of a double digit versus an ROE of a double digit. Okay, got it. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I'm showing no further questions. I would like to turn the call back over to Steve Muma for closing remarks. Thank you, Operator. The company's priority continues to center around the health and safety of our staff, partners, and community. We believe our business continuity planning and infrastructure has positioned us well for the reality of working remotely. Well, these last six weeks has caused us to maintain a more defensive approach to investment and liability management. Our long-term goals of delivering attractive risk-adjusted returns remains in place. We appreciate all your questions during the call today, and we look forward to discussing the second quarter in August. Have a a safe and healthy Memorial Day holiday weekend, and thank you very much for your participation. Thanks, Operator. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.